All right, as promised, Chris Garagiola. So off air, this, this makes me sound old. Joe Garagiola Sr. and I were travel buddies. In 2000, Jerry Colangelo called me and said, I want you to fill in uh, for Greg Schulte on the radio side. Greg's going to go to TV. Brenneman's going to go do national games. Brenly's going to go with them. You're going to travel with Joe Garagiola. So here I am with this Hall of Fame. We're bumping around taxi cabs. We're in an airport in Houston. Richard Simmons sees Joe, and Joe sees Richard Simmons, and Richard's in his jogging shorts. Oh and my Joe God. runs over to him as he could, and they stand there, and they embrace, and the whole airport goes crazy, and I'm like, what is going on here? It was like, you know, stories about the Beatles and all that. And then, of course, Joe Garagiola Jr. is the general manager of the Diamondbacks. They win the World Series. I'm the pre-post guy. I'm doing all that stuff. And then I go over to television, and there's this there's story of Garagiola Sr., Garagiola Jr., and then there's Chris Garagiola, and he's over at Phoenix Country Day. I'm like, I have to go tell this story. So I'm sitting in the bleachers with Joe Sr. and Joe Jr., and there's Chris, and he struck out five. No, I'm just kidding. Uh, okay, okay now. <laughs> so there's a long-winded intro. It's good to see you. Voice of the Diamondbacks pre-post, and he fills in. I should a fill in sounds kind of, I don't know, secondary play by play person for the Diamondbacks, I think fits better for you. And you're number one. And it's good to see you. It's it's great to see you. Yeah, I remember vividly when you were out. Uh, I don't remember who we were playing, but I remember the story that you did. I had a nice catch and I scored from second on a base hit and your your camera op made me look like I actually had some wheels. So I was very appreciative <laughs> of that. <laughs> you, you, you look like, oh, I don't know. Uh, well, let's not go there. I, I don't want to make it sound bad. But here you are. And I, first of all, enjoy listening to you because before the games and after the games sounds the same as during the games to me. You're well-versed. You're well-prepped. There's some stories that come out. You, you have some fun with it. This isn't brain surgery. It's baseball. How's it been from your point of view in year one so far? Yeah, I think it's been everything that I could have hoped it would be um you get a taste of broadcasting you kind of figure out um the joys and the challenges that come with it and you know i'm fortunate enough to work a few minor league seasons so you you know people kind of talk about the grind you know we played 140 games which is obviously still shorter but you know to and from on the bus and and you kind of going on these trips so when you experience that and you still have fun you just push yourself to try and get to that highest level um so when i had that opportunity and I learned that I was going to be going on some road trips, you know, New York City to start and then Washington, D.C. And, and calling these games. I, I never experienced such joy professionally um, than I have this first year. The, I don't want to say that the shine has worn off. It hasn't. But I understand to be consistent and strong for 162. Not that I'm doing all 162, but, you know, just, just to be present it takes a lot of time. It takes a lot of energy. Um, and yeah, so I'm, I'm getting my sea legs under me as we get a little bit closer to the halfway point, but, uh, I love it, man. It's, it's so much fun. Okay. So let's, let's circle back on this. Did you always know that this is what you wanted to do? Did the family name carry weight at all on you growing up? Was there an aha moment, all that stuff, just walk me through it. <clears throat> yeah. I mean, uh, to answer your question, no, I didn't know I always wanted to do it. In fact, I used to get really bored younger at games because I just wanted to play. I love doing athletic things. Um, as I got older, I started to see, you know, what that dedication level was like um, to be in that top, you know, 0.1% to call yourself a professional athlete. So by the time I was you know, graduating high school, going into college, I kind of had the thought in the back of my head, like, it's probably not going to happen. Um, and then I, like everybody else, was trying to figure out, you know, what do I want to do with my life? Um, there were a couple moments, very specific ones, where I thought that um, I could maybe get into broadcasting. Mm -hmm. I never was afraid of public speaking. I love sports. Obviously, you can merge the two together. Um, but it wasn't because of the family last name. It wasn't because of Joe Sr. I think that when I figured out that I wanted to do something, obviously, the fact that he had made and, and lived such an incredible life broadcasting probably was rooted in my subconscious. Um, it's not like I was like, Hey, I figured it out on my own, but um, yeah. I didn't, I didn't look at Joe senior and say, yep, I want to be like him. Um, I just kind of figured if I could do this, if I could make it, what a life this could be. 
your dad and your grandfather, did they ever talk to you about this career path? Um, I think my dad <laughs> kind of talked to the different stages um, of my playing career and what I could aspire to be. So I remember, you know, in the beginning, it was like, okay, well, if you, if you do these things, you know, maybe we can look at these kind of division one schools. And I wasn't the best student and I, I kind of lost focus and motivation. So then it was like, well, okay, maybe, you know, we'll look at some smaller schools. maybe take a gap year. Then it was like, well, like maybe you'll just be a pitcher instead of trying to hit. Cause you know, you're left-handed. And then it was like, well, maybe you'd be a sidearm guy. You know, it was like, by the end of it, it was like, well, you know, <laughs> so, uh, I think as I kind of found my way, he tried to offer support, but he'd be the first person to tell you, I never, I never pushed him to try and do or to be anything. Um, he never pushed me into baseball. He never pushed me into going after sports. It was always just sort of a stand back and observe. And then when he finds a direction, you know, try and help the best you can. When I got to town in 94, Jerry Colangelo had mentioned you get to know Joe Garagiola Jr. And then, you know, on the legal side and the, the, the attorney side, and it's just somebody to sit and visit with on the business end of baseball. And I'm curious if business of baseball ever got into your head or business of sports may be the better side, you know, go down the agent path, go down the legal path. Honestly, I was never really interested in that sort of thing. Um, it, there was a, I think at that time, frankly, the idea of, all the work that goes into trying to be a very successful agent or to run a franchise, it, it just takes up all of your time. Um, and while I'm very much, you know, love baseball and kind of focused in on baseball, there are moments where I, I do like the escapability of sports. Um, it's, it's a really difficult balance. Um, I don't know. I just think there was something inside of me that sort of knew yeah. that it wasn't for me. I didn't want to do it. I always kind of liked the stage. I don't want to say I like the spotlight because I don't even know if I, I enjoy it now. I just, I think people enjoy doing things that they enjoy. It sounds redundant, but like I said, I, I liked kind of serving as an entertainer. I think I was a class clown. I think that's a fair description when I was younger. I was never afraid of public speaking in college. I took courses that were geared towards language and, and, and spoken word and things like that. So I just early figured I like doing this. There are so many fallbacks in case it doesn't work out, you know, jobs that might be considered more, I don't know, commonplace than just saying I'm a hype, I'm a minor league broadcaster. Um, so if it didn't work out, I was willing to try that a little bit older rather than saying, well, it's probably not going to happen. And then regretting that, you know, for the rest of my life. If your classmates were a part of this, your classmates at Phoenix Country Day right now, would they say shocked that you'd be doing this? Or, oh, no, guy was a goof. Guy had personality, guy had fun. He grew up in a baseball. I mean, all that stuff. Yeah. What would your classmates be saying? Or what do your buddies say from high school? I think if I told them that I was like a team president or a GM, they would be like, I am shocked that they're letting this guy run those financials. <laughs> <laughs> this is not, no, I. I have friends from high school and a lot of them say something on the lines of like, it's so awesome that you're doing this, but it's never, you know, I never thought you would make it. It, it was just always like, even on those, those kind of darker days, um, you know, early in the minors, it was like, just stick with it. You know, like, you know, one day you're going to get here and I would, you know, I'm a, like Joe senior, I'm kind of a self deprecator. So it's like, Oh, one day you'll be working this game. I was like, nah, it's probably not going to happen. And, <laughs> And honestly, I, again, I was planning to going on to the minors again this season. You know, it it took a, a few years to get better. And then it took a splash of luck and really good timing. And I had that um, at the right moment. And that's how this opportunity came to be. Okay, so let's go down that path. Chris Gargiola is with us because there are people that take in these podcasts that I do and they want to know, how do you get there? Right. And it's usually college or there's professionals. I've I've had doctors, lawyers, all shapes and sizes. I hate what I do. Yeah, I make money, but I hate what I do. I want to be in sports. I want to be in sports broadcasting and all that stuff. So your path, let's just go from first game you ever recall doing at any level where you're like, were you sitting in the living room? Here's the one-two pitch and all of that. Or where was the first game? 
No, I was in college. I was at Trinity. A buddy of mine um, was. Trinity gonna, is where, Chris? San Antonio, um, like right in the heart of San Antonio, not too far from the Alamo. Uh, it's a wonderful school. Um, obviously, pretty small liberal arts, but a good sports program. You know, really good baseball program. Women's sports are fantastic. Um, and I just remember, I think I was a junior, and a buddy of mine was like, "Hey, I'm going to go call the football game for our webcast." Like, do you want to, do you want to do it with me? And I was like, yeah, like, let's, why not? And I mean, it's, it's like August in Texas and we're in this like tiny little booth, like rubbing shoulders. I don't think there's even an air conditioning unit. It's like, there's not even walls. It's like stuff that uh, bulletin boards are made out of. Like you touch it and it just kind of like falls apart. And I was so brutal listening to that tape. Just so awful. Do you still have the I, tape? Do you still have the tape? No, burned. Oh, <laughs> then I took the burnings and I burned those. All right. So, uh, <laughs> no, I just I walked out of there and I was like, that was so much fun. Like I had an absolute blast doing that. I was like, when's the next game? And they were like, well, there's a JV game. And I was like, OK, I'll do the JV game. And they had no rosters, no rosters for a football game. So literally, I was just like, man, 81, like what a catch gains 12, like 12 dropped it in on a dime. Like, I'm not really sure who it is, but his parents must be proud. Like that sort of stuff. Yeah, yeah. And just kind of stuck with it. And as I went into my senior year and that's really when, you know, the plane is supposed to take off into your future. It's like, all right, I kind of like doing this, but I have no idea. Like, just kind of like what you're asking, where do you start or that sort of thing? Um, so that's where I kind of, Asked my dad, asked, my, asked some people that were like working in baseball. And they said, well, like, why don't you get an internship? You know, that's a good place to start. Get some experience. The pressure's low. Um, I had a couple offers and I'll try and make this not a really long story here. No, it's fine. Take your time. Yeah, it's just um, I went to Cincinnati, a place I'd never been. I had another offer to go with the Dodgers. I think it was Joe Davis's first year um Vin Scully was still there but I had family in LA I've been to LA several times and I just had this sort of chip on my shoulder like you haven't accomplished enough on your own so that urge or that feeling prompted me to go to you know Cincinnati Ohio mm. and the the PR director Rob Butcher there was was highly recommended one of the best in the business um and so I went there, packed all my stuff up, drove across the country, moved in little Cincinnati, Ohio, and, you know, worked that season for the Reds. And, and early in that season, Marty Brenneman was there, you know, doing radio. And he was like, hey, listen, if you ever want to, you know, listen to the game in the booth, please, you know, be my guest. And I kind of asked Rob and I was like, is that my, am I okay? He's like, look, if you get your work done, I don't care what you do, you know, it's like, we're going to lose 100 <laughs> games this year. So just you know, try and make sure you're not in the way. I was like, awesome. And I must have sat in 40, 50 home games with Marty and, and Jeff Brantley or Jim Kelch was filling in sometimes. And I was like, this is awesome. Like there were maybe 5,000 people in the stands. I, I remember one game, uh, Jake Arrieta, no hit the, um, no hit the Reds in the largest margin of defeat in a no hitter. We lost 16, nothing. Chris Bryant, like was like four for four. He missed out the cycle because he had too many doubles. Like, and by the end of that year, I had asked a few people um, that I was working with. One of them who is now with the Dodgers, how do I get experience? Right. It's like the thing that young people talk about all the time. Nobody hires me because I have no experience, but how do I get experience if you don't hire me? And that's when I learned that there are opportunities in the minor leagues where you can kind of do another internship, but there's some on-air radio experience. And so I sent out an email. Oh, go ahead. No, no. And you end up doing a bunch of things, I would imagine. Do people oh, think, yeah. oh, they just show up and do games? No, you're doing like five jobs usually. No, I mean, in the beginning it was, I was lucky to be in a spot where we had enough of a sales team that I didn't have to also parlay that with sales. But there were other elements that were kind of sales-like, but it's a lot of volunteering. It's it's tarp poles, you know, early and late. We were in one of the rainiest parts of the country in Pensacola, Florida. Um, I had to put on the mascot suit a couple of times to film a couple of promotional events. You know, you, I had to drop off 
our little uh, game programs and those boxes were really heavy, especially in August. And, you know, yeah. they would get delivered at like 3 p.m. in the afternoon. So you're just getting ready to the game, you know, doused in sweat. And it was the mascot, the, the, the Pensacola was the Wahoos, right? So yeah, which is a fish. But our mascot was a sea creature named Kazoo. So you so had to put on Kazoo. I'd do that uh, a couple times. Yeah. Zip up, head on. It was uh, it was more clips, I think, but it was like, <laughs> like you got to step into the lower body, and then the head had like a strap, um, and like his eyes were really big and up here, but like human eyes, but, like look through the nose, so that way you could see. You have um, to have photos somewhere, Chris. You have to. Probably, probably not of me, but I mean, we can just we can just grab one and be like, oh, you know, that's there I am. But no, that that was literally it. It was it was. Again, a little bit of, of fortune there where, you know, working for the Reds, I was doing some minor league roundups because um, those were things that won the game notes. So I had the emails of all the PR people um, in the minor leagues, you know, Dayton, Pensacola, Louisville. And I sent emails to all of them. Within like an hour, Pensacola responded and they were like, actually, we are going to need somebody. Mm -hmm. And we think it'd be great to have somebody who was actually working with the Reds that kind of knew the system in the, in the other affiliates around us. So I got the job offered to me in like early September. We still had like another month to go. And I was like, cool, I guess I'm going here. And that's, that's how it all got started. But that was, that was just the beginning of what was gonna be a kind of a much longer journey. Okay, when was the moment you felt like I'm, I'm no good, I'm gonna quit? Because most everybody goes through that where oh, yeah. I just, I can't keep doing this. Did you have that? Oh yeah. Um, I don't even think it's, it's one singular moment. I think it just goes in waves. You know, we're going to play the Reds today. You know, Tommy Thrall replaced Marty Brenneman. I worked for him for two years in Pensacola. He was, he is the singular most important mentor I have had when it comes to radio. Mm. And you know, there were days and he was in at that point, I think year 13 of being in the minors at, at various different places. And, you know, he calls me one day and is like, I don't know if I can keep going. Hmm. You know, I'm, I don't know. I don't know if I'm going to ever be good enough to break through. And I was like, stick with it. Like, I'm telling you, you, I think you have a really strong chance. I didn't know anything. I just, the first day we worked together, you know, in 2017, I was like, how is this dude in the minors? Like, he sounds fantastic. So, yeah, I mean, it, it comes in, in various waves where anything you do, something creative, you have an expectation of what the final product should be. But when you get started, you're, you're unskilled. You, you, you don't know what you don't know. And you figure that out through trial and error. And there's plenty of failures. But if you just kind of remember that those are temporary things, and so long as you're enjoying the overall of what you do, then you'll be all right. You know, those feelings will fade eventually. Was the team good? Because I'll run into announcers like, I'm just not good. Well, how's your team? Oh, they're 30 games under 500. Well, and they're, and most nights we're, we're blowout city. It's really hard to stay up when, and doesn't mean you can't, doesn't mean you should. It just means you got to dig a little deeper in the tool bag and have a little bit more fun. It's not brain surgery, but were the teams you did good? Were there some players there that you did that now are at the big leagues? Yeah, I'm really, I'm really grateful that I got into double A. Um, I think it's the best, best possible league for a young broadcaster. I think low A and high A, while you have talented players, there is still just a discrepancy of, of play. The caliber of play still is pretty raw. By the time you get to double A, you kind of figure out who the guys are that are going to take off and the guys that this is probably going to be their last stop, but the level of actual play itself in that league is really impressive. Um, you know, we would not have a bunch of 15, 14 games with five combined errors. That, that doesn't happen. Guys make plays guys hit in big situations. You finally see some pitchers that have a little bit of command of secondary and tertiary pitches. So, you know, and, and, and the, the trouble with, with triple a, is you sometimes have guys who have kind of been in the big leagues and come down. They're not usually the friendliest of fellows to work with, you know, cause they don't think they should be there. And, mm. and so it can be a, it can be tense um, throughout the season. So I was very grateful to be 
in double A. And to answer your question, we had good teams. Um, you know, typically when the major league product is struggling, you're going to have some talented players in that minor league system. So, you know, you got to think after the Reds last playoff appearance, and I want to say 2012, might've been 2013, you know, they really struggled, had losing records kind of from 2014 to 2019. And so you get high draft picks in that 15 draft, that 16 draft, that 17 draft. So I remember working for the Reds on draft night when they took Nick Senzel, the second overall pick, it was like a big deal. And this is before I knew I was going to Pensacola. And then sure enough, second half, my first year with Pensacola Blue Wahoos, we promote three guys um, and two of them were shed long. And the other was, um, was Senzel. And it was like, Whoa, like big deal time, you know, Tennessee volunteer and, we made the playoffs that year, um, took down Jacksonville, but uh, the Hurricane Irma kind of made us cancel our championship series. And then in 18, um, I believe we also made the playoffs that season, but uh, came a little bit short against Milwaukee's double-A affiliate in Biloxi. So that, that certainly helped. But honestly, you know, it's about having good people in terms of players and honestly having good coaches. And uh, I had Pat Kelly – my first year. Um, and then I had Jody Davis my second year and you couldn't ask for two finer baseball men. Um, they really, they were patient with me. I had a lot of questions about a lot of different things. Um, that's the thing you learn pretty quickly. You know, I thought I knew baseball cause I just, as a little kid was in the stands for a bunch of big league games and I didn't know Jack. Um, mm -hmm. so they taught me a lot and, uh, yeah, they were, they were, additional paternal figures to have uh, in the minors, which is a very, very cool thing. Okay, so the Diamondback gig, how did you get it? You alluded to it a little bit earlier, just, you know, yeah, in whatever, just in the, how did that come to be? In, in 2019, my, my dad was talking about a guy that, um, I think the title he used was like our director of broadcasting and by that, by the time I had been in the minors for a couple of years, I kind of figured out who the people are that were sort of the gatekeepers to opportunities. You know, a lot of young kids, they'll be like, okay, I got to send my tape out to big league broadcasters. Cause if they listen to it and they think I'm good, they're going to be like, well, I got to call my agent and tell them about like, which is the exact opposite. I think of what happens. Um, you should only send your tape to, you know, big league people. If you actually just want it to be, you know, knocked down and, and really get a grade on it, which is important. You should do that. But directors of broadcasting, um, you know, people at agencies, those are the people that if you have some talent, they will, you know, they'll remember you. And so Scott Geyer, I just remember, I was like, look, can I just meet him um, and talk to him and kind of let him know that I'm on the radar? And he was like, yeah, sure. I'll ask. And so I think in the off season, like November, we just got coffee one time and had a great conversation. You know, he's an outstanding person. And, and I asked him kind of at the end, look throughout the year, um, can I just kind of send you some stuff and, and get some feedback? Cause I'm, I was then, and I'm still now in the stage of my career where it's like, I think there's some good elements, but I also think that there's areas to improve. And if you keep improving, then, you know, the sky's the limit. So he was like, yeah, no problem. And, you know, various points in 2019, I, I sent him some tape. He gave me some great feedback. Obviously, in, in 2020, you know, the pandemic hits and the minor leagues is essentially shut down. Um, so he What'd checked in a couple of times just to see how I was doing. What did you do during 2020 during COVID to stay sharp, sharp? So you have to remember, it's February. We're kind of getting into March. And all of a sudden, you know, the numbers in the U.S. are going up. And it's like, OK, we're going to shut down spring training. But everyone kept just kind of pushing back like when we would restart. So it's like, all right, we'll try and restart like end of March. And then we got there and it was like, well, like we're thinking mid April. And when spring training ends, that's when those, those minor league guys leave their complexes and they come down. So I was just trying to balance like being really cautious because that's, we didn't know, you know, right. Right. scientists and doctors and researchers were, were just scrambling to try and figure out exactly what was happening. So you know, I was shopping with a mask and rubber gloves and in washing cereal boxes in my sink, like when we got home, like, and then just trying to be ready for when we might actually start things up again. So these delays kind of kept happening up until about the end of May. 
And then our owner, who was very transparent, was like, look, I think we're going to have word here pretty soon that they're just going to cancel the season. And then sure enough, June 1st came around and um, that was it. There June 1st both- of 2020, you're shut down. Yeah. Then what for you? At the time, um, I had started seeing somebody still together now, by the way. Um, so that worked out. But <laughs> she had she had gotten COVID. Um, I had seen sort of the impact it had on her. I was trying to figure out what jobs you could do. And a lot of them just where we were living was, you know, kind of service jobs. You want to be a barista at Starbucks or whatever. And I just didn't think that was the safest thing. So I had some money saved up and honestly, I just hunkered down and lived as cheaply as possible. Um, you know, a lot of Kansas. You still soup. knew what you wanted to do. You still knew what you, I'm going to be this broadcaster. Yeah. I'm not going to go, I'm not going to go get sidetracked. I'm going to, I'm going to wait this out. That that's a lot, that's a lot for a broadcaster. To, to yeah. I'll out. admit. I mean, I, I think I was a little naive thinking that, well, you know, there'll be things that open up that need broadcasting. You know, I'm a lot, I'm near a lot of Southern schools. You can't necessarily knock down the doors of the SEC because those are, that's basically like working at a professional, you know, organization. You can't just be like, Hey, University of Florida. Like I hear you're no, they got like a dozen people on that list. So, so I just waited and it, it, it sucked because I had just gotten the job when Tommy left after the 18 season. And it took me a couple months in 2019 to kind of find my voice as a lead. And I did not have a a secondary guy the way that Tommy had, you know, the front office, our president basically was like, yeah, I know that that's what Tommy did, but we're not going to do that. You know, we're going to kind of allocate those funds somewhere else. So I was like, okay, well, so I was doing 140 games and playoffs, you know, solo. Um, And that really expedited, I think, the growth. So I felt like I had momentum. I thought 2020 for a lot, like a lot of people, was going to be a huge year. Um, It wasn't. It was this massive step backwards. And then when we come out, you know, there's 40 teams that have been contracted by uh, by Major League Baseball, and we have our affiliates basically forcibly change from the Twins and you know some great people there to the Marlins and. That was just a situation where it was like, okay, well, you know, you got to understand I had the, the, the Reds as our double A affiliate in 18, the twins as our double A affiliate in 2019, we lose the season in 20 and we come out of that with the Marlins as our 2021 affiliate. So it was like every off season, like, all right, I got to sh- 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 just like roll through the archives and figure out like, all right, what has this team done in the last 20 years? <laughs> so I mean it's cool now like the twins are going to come into town and I'm just going to be like yeah yeah Arias yeah yeah knew him but like yeah yeah I just uh <laughs> I think you put it best I I, did, I wasn't distracted I wasn't knocked off the course I, I was very privileged obviously you know if I needed help you know, mom and dad they, they were a call away they weren't spoon feeding me by any stretch of the imagination but they were mom was great about sending care packages and, and dad was always checking in. So I think that made what was a really difficult year a little bit more bearable. When was the moment you were offered the job and what was your initial thought? Oh God. Yeah. I mean, I didn't even answer the second part of your question, but I'm get sidetracked there. Um, anyways, like I said, I had met Scott in 2019 and 2020 happens and we were staying in touch again in 2021. And he called me in early September he was like, I don't want to get you too excited, but there might be an opportunity, but there might not be an opportunity. And I was trying to figure out if I should tell you. And I was like, oh, my God, Scott, like what, what's going on here? And Mike Farron, who is I'm sure, you know, know, and is one of the most beloved people in baseball, had been doing pre and post and, and kind of serving as that secondary broadcaster. Was having thoughts about wanting to do something different. You know, he let Scott know that he might not renew his contract. And so Scott informs me of this and then just says, you know, if that's the case, we want you to apply. Um, but here's the kicker. You can't tell anyone. You can't tell anyone. You can't tell your parents. Um, you can't tell your significant other. Because if, it, if this comes out, 
then then it's a, it's a problem. He wasn't offering me the job. It was just like, you know, if you kind of let me know there might be an opening before we're ready, that's when people just flood in their resumes and their tapes. And yep. it, it's just a headache, you know, minors, majors, it's gotta be way worse up there. So, so then about three weeks goes by and he calls me again and he lets me know, Mike is, he's told me he's not going to, um, he's not going to come back. He's not going to renew his contract. He'll make a statement on, on social in a couple of days, a couple of days, you know, Mike writes this really heartfelt kind of farewell and thank you. Um, and I had during that time, I organized all my stuff, you know, things I had worked on radio, TV, sent it in. And I was already planning on visiting my parents, you know, cause obviously they live in Phoenix. I only see them about twice a year, usually for holidays. So I went in and when I was in town, I went to a couple meetings, um, met with our producer engineer, Leo, and had a couple lunches. And then it was funny, um, you know, my significant other and I, we had been planning for a long time to go on this trip to the UK because she had never been outside of the country before. And I'd love to travel. Um, you know, I'd worked in Australia before I'd studied in London. It was, it was great. Hmm. And so Scott was like, have a great time. We'll talk when you get back cool, fine, go on the trip. You go internationally, you got to change your SIM cards and all that sort of stuff. So I remember when we landed back in DC and I popped my SIM card back in the phone and I had a text from Scott about 20 minutes prior. He was like, can you call me when you have a chance? So I'm tucked away in Reagan's you know, baggage claim. And he was like, I just wanted to congratulate you. Um, we're going to offer you the job. Hmm. And it was just like this this wonderful weight lifted off where, you know, I think when you get really close, it's the fear of kind of losing something really important that starts to set in and wondering if you'll have that opportunity again. So I know people think that it was a shoe in um, because of the whole family name thing. And I'm not dumb. You know, when I was looking around, of course, if there was an opportunity with the Diamondbacks, I was going to apply because I thought my odds would probably be the best there. But you know, I was looking at places like, well, maybe Kansas City will open up, you know, maybe there might be an opportunity with the Marlins or the Rays at some point, you know, just kind of scattering all over and just a phone call, you know, after four seasons and five years being in, in Pensacola and one phone call just accelerated everything. And here we are. Change your life. Change your yeah. life. If you had a moment, I'll let you go off a couple more. Um, you had any moments where you've sat in the broadcast booth and it's either you've overcome with a bit of emotion that you're there um, or it's a pinch me. I can't believe I'm here. Have you had those moments? Yeah, I have. Um, sometimes I'll be doing a game and Candy will be talking and the thought will just kind of creep into my mind of like, I'm in St. Louis right now, like calling major league baseball. Like, how sick is this? Like, this is, this is amazing. And I, I, um, I truthfully try not to play the Homer broadcaster. That's not really my personality. Um, I want the Diamondbacks to win, you know, pretty comfortably over everyone that we play. But, and I, I got some heat on Twitter at the beginning of this road trip because uh, Jack Sawinski hit a walk-off home run, and I, I guess I gave it a little too much sauce, um, and and someone was not too happy about that. And I get that. I get that as fans. Um, but like I said before, there were some moments when the D-backs, they came from behind, they were down big, and they wound up pulling out the game. And I just, I had never, the word I use is joy. I had never experienced such joy doing this, you know, profession ever in my life before that I was doing it right now, you know, as good things were happening for this team that I grew up rooting for that there's so much history, even though it's, it's the, you know, what the second youngest franchise by a day, I think we played the night before the Rays did. Um, so I am loving those moments. Um, it's now being balanced because I, I like I said earlier, I want to push myself. And so if I listen to some games or some broadcasts where I thought that my sound was mediocre or my preparation was mediocre, that can take some of the shine away because I'm, I'm changing the expectations. And I, I think I will always wonder, you know, how much of it was me and how much of it was the name Garagiola. Mm. But, at, but at the end of the day, I don't care. 
that's for other people to worry about. Those are other people's opinions. And if, if they don't like it, yeah, sorry about it. You know, I don't think they're going to make a change because of unnamed Twitter user handle one, two, three, four, five, yeah. you know, says hashtag yeah. nepotism. So when I, when I uh, hear you on the post, the pre and the post, what I really like, and it's just my thing, you tell it like it is. There is no sugar coating. There is no, he's getting a check from the team and he's got to hide behind the check from the team and that everything is great when it's not. And I think that there's an art to do that. And in this day and age, it's been lost where, oh, we got to just sell tickets, make everything sound great. Well, no, it's not great. And we should question if this player should be moved out of this position, if the same thing happens over and over. And when I've heard you in some of those spaces in the post game show in particular, it's like, yeah, that's how it should be. Tell it like it is. Please don't sugarcoat. Yeah, I think I think it's a few things. You know, it's it's all about going into the season with the right expectations, and then having those expectations sort of change after you know certain bookmark points of the year. You know, when you get through the first month and how that plays out, you can sort of look back on what your thoughts were going into the year and say, okay, are we kind of on that path? Are we overperforming? Are we underperforming? You know. Were the Reds going to be a, a bad team? Probably. Were they going to be three and twenty-two to begin the season? <laughs> Probably not. You know what I mean? So I think that like that's how much it can change. I I try to avoid the overall analysis of players and player performances for a few reasons. I never played the game at the professional level. I never got drafted. I never got signed. So yeah. honestly, it takes some serious gall for me to sit up on my high horse. And be like, how can you swing at that pitch? Like, you know, maybe do it one time and then speak with some level of credibility. That's where I try and introduce others. But I think you just have to be honest at certain points when something is not going well. And if it's kind of consistent, acknowledge it. Acknowledge that it's there. Acknowledge that it's unfortunate. It sucks. It's not fun. Losing isn't fun. I'm sure it's not fun for the team or a particular player if that player is struggling. But then try and look at some circumstances that might help us understand yeah. how we are getting to this place. You know, if, frankly, again, you know, you look at some of these teams with a shoestring budget and you're wondering, gosh, why, you know, why are we having such a hard time, you know, being competitive in the American League East? It's like, well, like, because here's historically how this goes, you know, you kind of have to have some, some talent on that roster. And, you know, with us, we have some bad moments. And, and frankly, I, I appreciate you saying those nice things, but, you know, Steve Berthume is a, is a great colleague. And a couple of times early in the season, he kind of pulled me aside and said, look, we're 12 games in, we got 150 more of these to go maybe don't use words like panic. And I was like, yeah, that's probably fair. You know, like that's, yeah. that might've been a slight overreaction to a couple of tough losses. You know, I, it's a long season. There are things that, you know, players can do that, that just make mistakes. We all make mistakes, right? We're all fans. There's some things that players and people do that, that aren't so acceptable. You know, there's a blatant lack of effort or something that's disrespectful to a franchise. Don't sugarcoat that, acknowledge it and then move on. Yeah. No, no, it's, uh, it's really good so far. And I could go down a bunch of other things, but I've done enough of your time. I've taken enough today. So get out. I appreciate you and you're doing great work. Keep it up. And thanks for dropping in. I appreciate it. I'll try and be more concise next time we do no, this. Oh, heck no. We could go an hour on the shift. And what are we going to do about the shift and all this stuff? So yeah. this is good for now, Chris. Stay well. Thanks. Appreciate it, Brad. Take it easy. This is Chris Garagiola. And we are back with more after this time out.